follow me. It's a, it's a simple request, but it has enormous implications. Jesus didn't want folks just to like him. He wanted people to follow him. There's a, there's a big difference between being a fan of something and committed to being a follower. How many people are planning to watch the Super Bowl this year? Some sports people take uh, of being a fan to an art form. More than just jerseys and hats, I've seen people in body paint and single-digit weather uh, or with permanent tattoos of their favorite teams. Kind of kind of rough to be a Cleveland fan this year with their new team name switch. It can be crazy the incredible lengths fans will go to show their team love. What about being a fan of Jesus? A lot of people do the, the fan thing in Christianity. They purchase uh, Christian branded things. Or listen to Christian music or read Christian books. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but what is the difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus? I do think there is a a darker side uh, to being a fan. A fan is often controlling, even angry when their team doesn't do what the fan thinks they should be doing. They don't make the play that they think they should make. We've all been in the room with a, an armchair coach, right? We've all seen someone get their day wrecked because their team uh, did or didn't do something right and lost the game. Maybe, maybe this is you. I don't know. Fans can sometimes play the comparison game. How much do you know about this player or, or this obscure detail? They want to prove that they are a real fan. And it's not just sports. It can be Star Wars nerds uh, or stamp collectors, video games, politics, you, you, you name it. Heck, sometimes it can, it can even be fun to be a fan, right? But Jesus didn't want fans. He definitely didn't need an armchair coaches. And nobody needs to play who's the better Christian. Jesus calls followers. Followers are on the team. Followers let themselves be coached. It's more vulnerable to be a follower. Last week, we talked about the concept of sanctification, God's renewing of us with consistent and constant growth. It happens every day, not just once. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's the heart of a follower. Followers don't tell God that God must be changed or this. You can't armchair coach God. The follower asks to be renewed to be pushed to right thinking and a willing spirit, to have a pure heart. Jesus metaphorically explains this. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into the new wineskins, and both are preserved. The clothes we wear now are mass-produced and are what are called pre-shrunk. The fibers have already been heated and washed, so you don't buy a, a size large. And after a few washes, it wind up with a, an extra small. If you were to patch a hole in a pre-shrunk shirt with a piece of cloth that is unshrunken, it will shrink in the wash and tear the hole and, and just make things worse. The whole thing needs to be new cloth. Let's look at, uh, let's look at wine. Wine in the first century was a way to make water drinkable. It would kill off the bacteria and allow people to ingest it without getting sick. 
during the fermentation process, newly made wine would release gases that would, would stretch the wine skin. So if you put new wine into old, inflexible wine skins, the gases would cause the old skin to burst and you'd be left with no wine skin and, and no wine. New wine needs new wine skins. Let's listen to that psalm again. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I think when we become followers of Christ, we have to enter with the expectation that God will make us new. There's, there's too many Christians that listen to Christian music but struggle to apologize. Or they, they have a, a Christian bumper sticker, but they feel like poor people cause their own poverty and, and should just pick themselves up by the bootstraps and work and work harder. It's not their problem. Or that they'll wear a cross, but, they, but maybe they yell at their kids. We have to expect that as our relationship with God lengthens, God will show us new things, new stuff. God is not in the business of patching clothes and old wineskins. God is in the business of making us entirely new. Pure hearts. Steadfast spirits. To follow Christ means that we must be open to being changed. And what's more, we have to be open to looking for places to change and seeking out resources to help us with that change. So this morning, where in your life do you feel God is calling you to change, to be renewed? Maybe it's your time and how you spend it. Maybe it is how you treat the people around you or, or what you do with the resources that God has given you. Or maybe it's just as simple as thinking about how much quiet space do you have in your life for God to start speaking to you? I have a feeling that each of us have places in our lives where God is challenging us to, to follow. My challenge for you this week is to take some time this week to pray a humble but dangerous prayer. Ask God, where in my life are you asking me to follow? It might be hard, but I think it's worth it. And it's what God calls us to do as his followers. The good news is that God guides and supports us as we follow. God gives us the strength, gives us community and his presence to help us on our journey of getting out of the stands as a fan and onto the field as a follower. Amen.